first um, to thank our director for having, I don't know if we can thank you for having the artistic talent. We know that you developed this, but to thank you for taking a step forward to invest the time, to invest the research necessary to make a film this quality and give us kind of a opening to have a broader discussion. I want to tell you what we want to do. We're going to give some time for Perez to say a little bit about the film. Uh, within the context of the discussion, we've asked our uh, scholars to join us here also to talk a little bit about it because each one of these individuals has been fairly active on campus in their own right. I want to begin by giving Perez a sense of who's in the audience. First, among the students here, how many have traveled to the continent? How many have traveled to Africa? How many are first or second generation African descendants in this country? Okay. Okay. Among those young people who are no longer students, <coughs> meaning people with gray hair and everything else, how many of you have traveled to the continent? Okay. Or work there? So we have a decent representation of people who have a, at least an introductory um, to some of the issues you were talking about. I want to start by giving you an opportunity to say a little bit more about the film before we delve in. If there's anything that you've experienced uh, in, in taking the film to other places so far, if there are any other revelations that you've come across. Sade McMillan, 
who also was first generation, but first generation Caribbean. Uh, Gabrielle Franklin from that at the, the very well-known African uh, country of Charlotte, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> and Bethlehem Meshesha, who is first generation Ethiopian, right? Okay. So I'm going to start at this end, and I'm going to ask you just for your general uh, impression of the film. And if you want to add a brief uh, addition about any experience you may have had that might have mirrored or was a little different from what you saw there. So um, I think the film was uh, set up in a great, first of all, thank you for having me, everyone. <laughs> um, uh, I think the film was set up in a way which is interesting. I've never seen a direct conversation between a panel of Africans and African Americans. Um, I identify as both. So it was interesting to see both points of views. Um, I think I'm going to wait to kind of voice my opinion on some of the things that happened to the movie in the movie um, after the conversation kind of gets going a little bit. But. Hello, everyone. Um, I identify as African American, and before coming to Chapel Hill Higher Educational, um, I had never had the been exposed to. Um, the African community that much. Um, so having a conversation between African Americans and Africans was really foreign to me because I didn't even know there was a rift between the communities at all. So watching the film and reflecting on the environment here at Carolina, I can definitely understand the perspectives that were voiced within the film. And it was great. It was, I find it, the word I use, what people use, groundbreaking between the African American community to start that conversation more on a younger level. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I too had never seen the direct dialogue in a film um, between Africans and African Americans, but I'm also from New York, and so I had seen the rift a little bit more between like diaspora communities, I should say, um, between people are decimalized on every scale from, even among Africans, like from country, or from how long you've been in the US, um, and how legitimized your Africanness is, and um, among, I, I identify as West Indian, um, and even among like the Caribbean community, there's like, so when did you come to the United States, and how West Indian are you, and so, um, it was interesting, um, like I said, seeing the direct dialogue between uh, Africans and African Americans and almost having no debate, no debate amongst both sides of like what they choose to identify as. There was no question among the Africans like whether you're really African or among the African Americans as like what you choose to identify as. There wasn't really like a debate amongst both sides, which is something that I feel like I've seen um, more so than African versus African Americans. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very grateful and excited to be with you all here tonight. My name is Omololu Rohiwa Babatinda. Um, my father is from Nigeria. My mother is from South Africa, but I was born here in America. I identify as, I guess, I would identify as politically black. Um, I really, I feel like my upbringing as a first generation, whatever you want to identify it, has really been a, a practice of kind of these discussions that we saw in the film of trying to maintain oneself and one's personal dignity and when people are saying things that are degrading to, to you, but also trying to think about that in reference to a larger context and a, broader system that we are all encompassed in as black individuals. Um, I really appreciated the kind of interviews that you had where the um, people speaking were looking at themselves in the mirror. I didn't realize that at the beginning, but then I realized that that's what was happening because um, I feel that it is a question about how one has been taught to see oneself and to see others and how one chooses to relearn how to see ourselves. So I'm excited to discuss that. I was going to ask you, um, and following up with what the 
they said, um, we've actually shown two other films on this topic. Uh, one film by Isaiah Holloway called African to African American. And we also showed the Neo African American, which discusses uh, similar kinds of issues. But this is the first one, as I said, that really uh, used some of the techniques that made us think a little bit more about looking in the mirror, about understanding some of the secondary conversations that occur outside of earshot. So um, I'm hoping that you can say a little bit more about how that discussion developed. In the beginning, it seemed to go to a fairly high level of shouting. And, and then sort of swept, swung back the other way. So I'm wondering if you intended it to go like that or did you just let it develop? Um, you're talking about the, 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 the two the conversations. The two in the beginning, shall, actually, the shouting came towards the, the middle. That whole shouting part, yeah. Shouting, yeah. So that was in that was in the middle, and it, it during the most, the most unusual time. This is when I thought, okay, we're gonna make it through without shouting, and then the, lo and behold, the shouting happened, and it was so weird because <clears throat> I was sitting there listening to the shouting, and it was it felt like an out of body experience because. I was trying to figure out what the shouting was about, really. So in, the, in my head, since I'm directly in my head, I'm also being the narration. And as I'm looking at him, I'm thinking, okay, what narration are we going to put over this right now? And at that point, it hit me like, this is, it seemed like a misunderstanding, a cultural misunderstanding about how one behaves when one is slighted. Yeah, but, but we definitely let it, Fingers crossed, we just said, okay, we're just going to roll the camera. We had two hours, and we said, we'll just roll the camera nonstop for two hours. <coughs> Every once in a while, when we had to like, break and do camera shifts, then I would just throw in a, a sentence or a phrase, and then just let it go. But before I go any further, please, before, can we just make sure I have to do this? Otherwise, I dare want to kill me. Uh, there are bracelets back there that have to be handed out to every single person who's in the, in the room. So if you don't have a bracelet, please, please give out those bracelets and I'll tell you why you're getting those bracelets. But that's the answer to your question. Okay. I'm going to ask the next question. You can hand it to Zahra and I'll ask her. We're going to, don't worry, we're going to bring in the audience in a second. I just want to get a few things out of the way and then you'll be able to engage with both the director and with these individuals because these are individuals, as I said, who are active on campus and engaged. So this is the question I will ask you all. How do you characterize the relationship between African Americans and Africans on this campus? On this campus? Yeah. <laughs> um, I would characterize it as Yeah. Into the 
legislation that won't. Yeah. You also tell people what the oasis is, because I'm not sure the folks here know what else is that Yeah, um, so oasis is the African Students Association, and oasis is the black student movement. Sorry, but BSF, did I switch them around? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Which might be a good thing, but anyway. <laughs> Go ahead. How would you characterize, how would you characterize relations? Okay. I, um, <laughs> in my first two years here, in my first year here, I should say, I, um, I hadn't really seen much overlap between the African American and the African community. Um, and I hadn't even noticed there was that disconnect, or that disconnect hadn't been at like the forefront of my mind, at least, um, until probably more so my sophomore going into my junior year. Um, I just never saw the overlap to even put to even compare the two or to even um, try and gauge how the two communities interacted. So I guess that goes to say that it's very, in my experience, has been a distant uh, relationship, a disconnected one, at least. Um, I would categorize the relationship as unfamiliar. I feel like, um, those who identify as strictly African American are unfamiliar with their, maybe you want to say, roots to Africa, how they're connected to Africa. Um, and then I find that since we are at PWI, that a lot of, I don't want to speak on the guys, but um, African students may feel like that since there, there is such a small population, that in order to connect back to Africa, that they find ways to identify and like congregate within their own community with like Oasis, for example, um, in order to provide that identity on campus. So unfamiliar is the word that comes to me. There's not really a bridge between the two which causes tension and strife. I agree with her as well. And I want to, um, to add to that just a little bit. I think the connection between the two here on this campus particularly only exists because we are the minority together. And outside of that, there really isn't a connection between the two. Um, there are, the organizations exist separately. Um, they meet at separate times. And there's, there are some, like they said, uh, gatherings where they're together to discuss why they're not together more often, which uh, I think goes to speak for itself, the relationship here on campus. Hi, uh, my name is Wilma Mani, I'm a senior uh, here in Carolina, and I'm from Tanzania. Um, so when I first came here, so I first came to the US in 2011, my freshman year, um, and when I first came here, I thought, oh yay, African Americans, I can sort of go there and then we meet together, because I, I've never once in my life been a minority. It's only coming here to a public institution. You know, there's a majority um, of white people, not even white people, the majority of North Carolinians. Um, but I quickly found out that it wasn't so easy to infiltrate that space because, because in my experience, African Americans also sort of stuck to themselves. Um, and going through the years, I, I obviously, I naturally gravitate towards Oasis, um, and I think for individuals that gravitate towards Oasis and not, for example, BSM, it's because you identify as African or as having African parents, um, and you live here, or you're an international student as I am, um, and BSM is more so, the sort of activities that, that they do and that they're occupied with is, is about the African American situation in the U.S., right? Uh, whereas Oasis is more about, you know, African culture. And so, yeah, I, for me, it's it, they're very separate. And I, the event that you mentioned of Monolu uh, was the kind of the first one that I attended that Oasis and BSF came together because, really, as as you've mentioned, we 
there aren't many instances that, that these two uh, come together. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna leave a, a bug on the table and then I'm gonna open it up. And that bug is for the director and for um, those that are here on the on the scholars panel. And that is, if the question of history, and I don't mean the history of whatever, I mean the history or the moments at which different sets of Africans came to this country shaped the way the relations took place. You understand what I'm saying? During different periods of history, say from the 60s on, you had a group of Africans that came to this country that were part of an independence era group who had a different political sense of their relationship to African Americans. You had people from ANC, you had people from Mozambique, you had people from, if you understand what I'm saying, so I want you to, to kind of consider that as a question, and I know there's some people here in the audience who have traveled uh, in Africa and worked with Africans who came here at a different era. So please keep that, we'll get back to it. Let's open it up the, the floor for questions right now. Please stand up. Good evening, Charles McCown. Charlotte, I'm first generation American via DRC. <coughs> I attended Oasis. I was in the last city. I remember Dr. Professor Jordan after the beginning of his class. Um, I think for me and my experience at USC, like there were a lot of hard questions that weren't being asked. You know what I mean? Like in terms of like how the Greek letter organizations can claim African history, but then where is it? You know what I'm saying? Or you know what I mean? How we how we can have a conversation about uh, Africanism. And like you, were, like you were saying, the time periods and the, 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 uh, the, the space that you were coming from, like, you know, the, the, the diaspora and the internationalism that was happening in the 60s and 70s and that pan-Africanism, those people were coming to kind of create for Africa on the world stage. Where right now, I think like people come over here and get education and they don't want it, they don't want it, you know what I'm saying? They don't want it, like Africa can be forgotten. And I think that those concepts or subcontexts are still what we're kind of dealing with. I'm just hoping that you see us asking the hard questions. Uh, that make people actually go and step outside of, of, of the comfort zone because so, this might be the first time they've been challenged to do so. And I mean, I, I, I trust that, uh, that you are doing that, but I'm just curious to know what that looks like right now. Like, is it just, I mean, from besides what I see in the panel, I just drove up. I, I missed the movie. <coughs> I mean, like, what, what, else, what else is going on? How else are you engaged in the conversation? I'm trying to figure that out. Okay. Can we take a second question? Can we take a couple of them? Right. Go right ahead. Um, I'm Curious. Um, when the question was first posed to you, like, what's the relationship like? I kind of noticed that you guys paused and was cautious with your words of being selected. Mm -hmm. Is it because of the audience or certain people in the audience? Are you concerned of repercussions? Or I mean, because I, I I've seen that you guys are being careful and not necessarily truthful. So, and I think that's what causes the disconnect. Okay, we'll take, we'll take one more and then we'll start. So, we have one gentleman who wants to know what we're doing. Another person, he's questioning your Swear 
that once the camera, because they'll tell me when the camera is not rolling, but the moment it starts to roll, they're like, well, you know, it's motherland, it's, it's just this beautiful place, <laughs> there are gazelles leaping in the meadows. I'm like, no, seriously. Um, and so that's the reason why I know what you're saying, because it, it, took, it took a while, even for those people to open up. It took a while for them to get there. And um, we're working on uh, the distribution right now, so it, it, we're just waiting for the reason. The full frame, the full frame documentary film festival happens in Europe next week, and I believe it is. Oh, no. Because you know how these things are like deadlines? <coughs> yeah, they have deadlines. And sometimes you, it's easier when someone invites you than, you know, putting your $50, $60 there and crossing your fingers and hoping that it matters to them. Yes. That's I the key. Exactly. Around here and, yeah. And support yeah. So. Was there a group hug ever? Oh yes, group hug. So. <laughs> I will tell you. I'll tell you three things that happened. The uh, my friend Shiro there, who you know had her moment of um, the screaming match that she had with Lakora, who I loved him. Because <laughs> um, she, no, I, I love her. She called me a month after we finished filming and she asked me to pull her out of the documentary. And, but she sent a release, so there was that. Uh, that that's just an FYI. You sent a release, yeah, well. And, um, but she asked me to pull her out, not because, she asked me to pull her out because she said she had done a 180. And I said, I said, and I engaged her in conversation and she said, you know, after, after filming that, I went home and something, she said, something in me changed because now I don't look at African Americans the way I did before I filmed that. <coughs> and, uh, and they did have a group hug at the end of all this. It's just there were, there were trust me, we have the footage, it's just the sound was so muddled because they were all talking over each other, people were hugging each other, and there was just no place where we could put it where it would make sense. And Benjamin who was in the car, didn't have any African American friends for 25 years. I went to visit him as a dear friend of mine, and um, I went to his house one day. I think it was like three months after, and there were all these his his his, his daughter and all her friends and all these different people were just all around the house. And he pulled me to the side and he started pointing people out. He said, African American, African American, African American. I mean, because now he's conscious of it. So, and that's what we wanted to do, was to just get people conscious, because it's all about choices that you make. That's really it, it's the choices that you make. To make conscious decisions when you, when you show up, and who you're going to interact with, make that effort. It's uncomfortable sometimes, but you know what? Still push, you know. Do any of you all want to respond to the, the question of the veracity of your responses? Well, I want you to apologize. <laughs> Spaces. So for me, I'm I really am pushing this. Like, like I see this. I see that we're united type thing. So maybe that's even clouding the way that I'm willing to actually address what's going on. To be occupying these two spaces, not one to, wanting to offend both spaces, and then realizing that's a circle in itself because you're never going to address anything. Um, but yeah, I don't. And I guess like comfort level to. Um, about speaking about other um, black individuals. I don't know. It's 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 just it's kind of hard. It's okay, my hesitation, I can speak from my personal um, perspective, is making sure that I didn't allow like my personal experiences to crop also the way that I was like analyzing the situation at hand. And so I spent time here even struggling to figure out where I identify because 
I mean, there's like five other Caribbean people on the campus. So I spent my time trying to find them. And then I, I took less time analyzing the groups that were pre-existing and more time trying to figure out exactly like where I fit in and, and how I identify and analyze a little bit more because I had never been questioned before. Like I never had to think, oh my gosh, like I have to pick I had to pick a realm to exist in. It was just always, I mean, I'm black and I'm from the Caribbean, from Grenada. I mean, it never, I never had to like think about it until I got here and then it took a while to even understand what I was seeing and what was actually happening around me. So I wanted to make sure I articulated that well. Um, my categorization came from personal experiences because I myself am unfamiliar and I'm still struggling with that within myself. Um, after watching the film the first time, like in a room by myself, I was like, uh, I'm about to trace my roots. Like, what's going on? I, I remember tweeting, like, the last thing this world needs is for me to find out my ancestral African country, but that's exactly what I'm about to do, and it, that's what I'm ready to do. Um, but I still identify as African American. I'm not sure if that's going to change once I do it, because it's so unfamiliar. I was going to say similar, pretty much what everyone else said. I was hesitant to speak on the topic as well because it, I didn't want to speak from a place of personal experience because we were asked to analyze the campus as a whole and that's very hard to do when you kind of live in your own little bubble. <laughs> so I didn't want to speak and say that, you know, in my experience there's not any integration because I am a part of Oasis but not a part of BSM when there could possibly be an integration that I'm not aware of because the campus is so large. Um, so that was my hesitation. I didn't want to, I tried to tiptoe around it and kind of say that I don't see an existing relationship, but it doesn't mean one doesn't exist necessarily. Um, and, and obviously there isn't really one because everyone else said the same thing as well. So that was my hesitation. Um, Um, I feel like I was pretty honest. <laughs> um, <laughs> you were. You were. I, because I, this question I've thought about quite a bit, and even, I mean, it was a very, very obvious, when I first came here, it was very, very obvious and very blatant. And I do want to mention as well that within Oasis or within the African community here, that there is a distinction, there is a, there's a thing, there's a, there's a divide. <laughs> There's a divide between international African students and African students whose parents, who, who either moved here when they're two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten years old, or who were born here and whose parents are African. Um, there's that distinction. And what I found in my early years um, is that most international African students wouldn't come to Oasis. Um, and my understanding of it, or my Feelings about Oasis as well. I mean, in the beginning, I used to hate Oasis. I remember going to one meeting, um, and we were talking about film, African film, and we were talking about traditional versus modern film, and, and there was this dis distinction made that traditional film is movies that feature um, huts and huts, and then modern <laughs> and then modern film or modern movies were just like in cities and whatever. And I was like, but you can't. I mean, people still live in huts today. So the, like what what is what is tradition versus modernism like what you know I felt like that that, that, that space wasn't really dealing with that so I, I really got pissed off and I sort of came to the conclusion that for students that and that's my conclusion that's my opinion that's from my experience is that most of the time students of whose parents are African and who have lived in the US for a long time have this romantic and very longing for Africa and for culture, where I, you know, growing up in Tanzania, you know, it's like, okay, I don't know, you just think about other things and not culture and how to pre represent yourself. And I only came to sort of notice this title African when I came to the US, actually. Um, so even with the noises and distinctions, um, yeah. That's okay. uh, I have actually five hands. And since I don't see any more than those five hands, we must first tell Perez that she gets no dinner tonight because we're already past our reservation. 
No, no, I'm joking. We're gonna feast. We're gonna feast. So let me tell you the, let me let me tell you the hands I saw. This hand, this hand, this hand, the gentleman there, and then you will end. Okay? So please stand. Please stand and and ask your question. And please try to make it. Yeah, I'll try to make it. So I have a question and a comment. The first is to Perez. You know, I noticed that the Africans were on one side and the African Americans on, on another side were that fairly deliberate. Yes. Um, okay. And then my my comment is is that listening to these young, beautiful women here, um, how as black people we kind of separate and divide ourselves and will it ever change? I originally from Seattle and East Africans were very divided at the time. I've been here 20, 20 years from black Americans. And you know, you guys, we have black Americans, African Americans, we have people whose parents are African and the kids were born here. We have East versus West. And do you see any hope for all these divisions you know, kind of ridding themselves and us moving forward as black Yes. Thank you very much. I'm 
very good way for this opportunity because these conversations have really have really bothered me being here since 2010. Um, I've worked in different environments and tried to build, build a relationship with African American men that I always hate to work them. So I always tell them, I say, why is it so hard to reach out to a black man? But currently, I just made a friend anyway. His name is CJ. So, I just want to appreciate this conversation. It's priceless. When I say it's priceless, I don't know how it feels. It's emotional for me to hear people say this. And I, I want to say to her, she's Nigerian because I'm Nigerian. Uh, I want to ask you one question. When you say you identify with the boat, because first of all, I know a Nigerian man, and I know it's a topic of mom. I know he's already, you know, to the devil. Where do you really, what do you feel like you have balanced the two of them? Do you feel like you have kind of like balanced both the American culture, you know, the two basic things? Do you feel like you figured it out? How, how do you feel about the whole thing? Does it affect how you understand the general situation or, or what? Like, because I, I saw what you were trying to say, but I didn't really get your opinion when you said you feel like you're in between the world of them. In terms of relationships, I Yeah, so look, you will come right back. Can you pass it to this last question? Okay, I'm trying to keep it short. Um, my, well, before my question, I want to say, I don't. If we are trying to bridge gaps, I think it goes back to what you're saying. Why are we always setting up divisions or saying you have to be this or that or that? And I'm curious about why you made it the conversation between Africans on one side, African Americans on the other side, and Africans versus African Americans. Because if you are trying to bridge that gap, I think setting up those divisions or making people choose and say, well, I'm first generation, I, I'm this. You can be African and African American. You can be I feel like I'm multicultural, so I am, even though I'm black, I feel like culturally there's parts of me that are white American, there are parts of me that are black American, there are parts of me that are African, and I feel like for this, for this film, I feel like it's really been my life. These conversations between friends and family members who are unfamiliar, and I feel like I've lived in between all these worlds, and so trying to bridge that gap, I'm just curious why you set up that visit that way. The question that hasn't been asked is how come I pick all women <laughs> That's not a question. Uh, Reg, you have a question about the vision. You said you're setting up the vision on the walls or on a. Did well, it work for you for Well, we set up, if you notice, the film, the, the, the color palette of the film is very bland. So when each individual person is on camera, if you're not reading the law of threads, you can't tell where they're from, right? But we wanted to put, I, I, I specifically chose the title, which was initially Africans versus African Americans, since it, the script was initially written in 2005. Then by the time people jumped on board, it became Africans versus African Americans healing the sibling rivalry, which I hated. Um, and I wanted Africans versus African Americans for two reasons. One reason, because it pissed enough people off. Because it did. There's no need to have called that, called the movie, The Pursuit into Blackness, something that people were like, oh, that's great. You wanted something that had a visceral reaction, people would read it and they'd go, Ugh. something, feel something. So everyone who read it felt something. And I was like, I'm not changing it. Isaiah sat me down, says you have to change this thing. He said, it is not changing from that because that was drawing people into the conversation that we wanted to draw them into. And then if you go on Google, I swear to God, and you put it there, there's already one million people already doing it, so there was no need to reinvent the wheel. What I did do also at the end of it, by the time it was all done, was sit with it and say, okay, what is the film about? Then Bound came in front of it. Then it became Bound than Africans versus African Americans. Because from that point on, you could make it bound <coughs> Shia versus Sunni, male versus female, whatever. It is really about how people who find themselves in opposite sides of history get to deal with that. How do you resolve that conflict? By having a conversation. It seems so simple and so trivial and so, but we have had these 12 people are more changed now by the fact that they just spoke. Their minds, it, it, Something happened with them just sitting in the room getting that frustration out 
and then not moving on. They're like, oh, okay, I, I learned something, something new today, as opposed to shoot them, shoot them, bang, 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 testosterone all over the place. You know what I mean? And I think that's the reason why you have all women here, because I was excited. I said, yes, you know, because this is, to me, this represents where I feel, this is just my opinion, that the world needs more this right now, yes. more this, because there's too much testosterone, there's too much of that energy out there. It's great energy, don't get me wrong, but it needs to be balanced with this. And then somebody asked about, yeah, thank you, <laughs> <laughs> And I, yes, do I think that this is going to get better? Yes. Why? Because we look at the name, okay, I wrote this. I was walking around and I knew somebody would ask this, so I wrote this down. Okay, see, we as people of African descent, we come from a place that is very ethnically strong. We identify with ethnicity very strongly. And right now we are living in a place that requires us to identify racially. But we come from an ethnic identity going on. Even when dealing with Europeans, there are people who originally started with ethnic identities that then got dwindled down into nations because Sweden is for Swedes who have a specific story. But you, when you go to Africa, you don't have, I'm, I'm a Luo, there's no Luo land. There used to be. There isn't anymore. And that's the reason why you saw this little tiny divisions amongst Africans, because we are only 50 years old as nations. 50, 51, 52. The same goes for African Americans. We're the same age, 64, 64. I'm talking about the end of Jim Crow, 64. Independence, 64, 62. We are young, but we are in nations that are like 200, 300 years old. And this is what's going on in Sweden right now. The Afro Swedes are losing their damn minds, fighting the Swedes to be part of Sweden, to belong there. And you, you have to tell them, you have to understand, you're, getting a, you're going against a history. These people's history is like 300 years old. They have identified themselves as this one race, but we look like this. This is Sweden. This is the language, this is the country. So it is going to happen. It's just going to take us some time. I'm very confident. And we're moving faster, by the way. We're moving really fast, so we will get there. <laughs> Thank you for your um, question. When I introduced myself, I made the very um, direct decision to introduce myself as Omomolu, the female of Baba Tunde, because I do understand and have deep respect and reverence to my Nigerian and my South African cultures. I was raised in an African household, but to kind of, but to, to, to simplify my existence, to these two sites when I was socialized in America would not be authentic to myself, would not be authentic to my experience. So I, I wanted to address that. Um, and kind of even to what Uma was saying about having to learn Africa through the words of your parents. And, and letting that shape who I am and letting that shape how I decide to represent myself is a very conscious decision of mine. But, um, yeah, so um, in spaces here in America, when I'm in African spaces, I'm considered too American. When I'm in American spaces, I'm considered too African. It kind of goes back to the um, statement that was made by um, the woman who was the author of, yes, about I am who you think I think I am, and making the decision to be I am who I am, who I am, and, and kind of deciding who that is, and deciding that I am a product of black resistance, and that is what unites my South African, Nigerian, American identity. And that is who I am, I'm black. And um, that doesn't mean I'm any less Nigerian, that doesn't mean I'm any less South African, but it means that I'm, this is, this is, this is the way I wanna, and I feel like this speaks to your question, how are we going to unite? Unite through understanding the system that has been built in our opposition, and unite through these, like we saw in this movie with Pichis Lumumba, and, Martin Luther King through these, and through the resistance struggles of the Maroon Slate, through these shared black liberation struggles, for, this is how we should unite and identify ourselves. So thank you for your question, and yeah, I hope that answered. I felt you. I don't know if anybody else in this room felt the frustration when you were speaking, but I, I just wanted to let you know, I felt 
your frustration when you said you have been trying to connect. I felt you. So I know. And one step at a time, brother. Just one step at a time. You have one. With him comes many. You have family. You have family. Go break bread with him. And more. Give the entire family. And I just want to answer the young lady who is right there. You make a very valid point, which connects with exactly the point that, that this gentleman stated, which is right now we are playing into a system. We are now in a, in a racial system. And we are playing along with that because we feel we have to play along with that. And that's because right now we are. And I feel like we're going to break free from that. We're going to start identifying ourselves the way we want to identify ourselves. We're going to start having conversations about our identity with amongst us when we are the center of our universe and not the other system. And so that's the reason why Bound, as you noticed, only had the people it had. And one thing that was really important for me was to be about an African talking to an African American. That was really important so that we are the center of our universe when we have a conversation about us and where we go from here. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but this is exactly what's going to end up happening. Moses, do you want to say anything in this conversation? I know it's, it's kind of placing you on the spot. I call him, so he can have a And then we'll, then we'll end. I know that a couple more of you have something to say, and I'll give you an opportunity, and then we'll end. Go right here. Tell them who you are. Stand up. <laughs> Hello, my name is Moses Sanchola. Uh, unfortunately, I got here late. I wish I could have seen this film. Um, I'm also a first generation. I'm actually blue as well. Yeah, I'm also blue. So, uh, I honestly don't have anything to say. I just, uh, the, reason, the reason that I asked Moses to say something is that Moses' family uh, runs a very popular um, African restaurant, Palace International. And many of you, how many of you have eaten at Palace International? Yeah, so this is one of the places, at least in my estimation, in the community that has reached out to African Americans and made us feel at home. We've actually gone there and held events for the Stone Center in Palace International. So I wanted you to say a little bit about what kind of, 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 of politics, what kind of cultural, or what kind of, of, of way did your uh, family model itself so that that became a, 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 a way of being in the community? So I think something very important that you touched on earlier was um, how through our history, the relationship between Africans and African Americans have changed. Um, when my parents first began the Palace International in 88, um, there was a much smaller African community in the U.S. and there was also a connection between African Americans along to and, and seeing that their relationship between the two. So I hear like, I call them like the golden years of when my parents or their, their, their friends or relatives in the area talk about how it was growing up here, but when they went to college here, versus it, how it is now. There was very few Kenyans. There, there's even less rules that my ethnic group. There was very few Nigerians, if you could imagine. There was even <laughs> few. So, 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 so what you saw happen, and at least there was, a, there was a central point where you had anyone, no matter where they came from, African American or African, going to a place and you know, breaking bread, enjoying music, enjoying themselves generally. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. <laughs> but this has changed, obviously. So as times progressed and more and more and more Africans came and there was a different culture as you know, Generation X and the Millennials came up, there was a, there's been a wider gap. Mm -hmm. As far as now, um, I look at the palace and uh, we've, had, we've definitely made business shifts, right, De based on the politics and economics of the culture, you know? And th that's, all, that's the only thing I can really speak to, is how it's changed over the years for yeah. my parents. Um, so outside of, outside of that, the Palace International goes beyond this way to try to be a home for everyone. And we do try our best to bridge the gap. Being a product of the first, I mean, our first generation, so, like many of you all on the panel, I also, you know, sympathize with the same things that you guys 
guys have gone through. I think um, the palace now, honestly, doesn't cater to that. I mean, Africans don't excuse me, frequent our restaurant. We're, we're, we're not supported by Africans. And um, I have my theories on why that is, but, yes. sorry? <laughs> now he's really upset with me. <laughs> Tell the truth. and how Africans, I mean, Africans don't tend to like go out and splurge on food that they can make at home. <laughs> Whereas, I mean, <laughs> that's, just, that's just what it is. And so the idea, the idea of like supporting your own um, becomes, uh, that idea, I mean, supporting your own is, I think, a very nuanced idea in Africa, you know? You, again, like, Wilma said she didn't, she wasn't African until she came here, right? So that idea like of Africans coming and supporting their own is also very, and that, these are not the same about Africans. I think like Ethiopians and Eritreans do a really good job of supporting their own. Something that I really, I, I like prevent them for because otherwise, I, I mean, for my establishment, I don't see that. I think on the African-American standpoint, I think there's just been a further divide as as our generations have grown up. And I think it's been brought on, again, in my theory, it's been more of a, I know growing up here, unnecessarily, I wanted to, you know, bond with everyone, but I was almost forced to kind of distinguish myself at times. Because, and this, and, and this isn't, I don't think, specific to an African, I think generally younger kids distinguish themselves. So you, if you're the other, right? It's just very easy as an African or Af first generation African. So if you're told you're the other, then you're like, you know, at some point you either embrace it or run away from it. And honestly, I see more first generations running away from it. But if you choose to embrace it, I acknowledge that, and which I did, and you know, distinguish myself as an African and kind of play into that, you know, us versus them. And I think that carries on as adults. I mean, a lot of the African Americans that are older, it's just a matter of being scared of it. Like, oh, I, oh, I've heard of the palace, yeah. Oh, so why haven't you come? Uh, I don't know. I had a phone call today with someone who called and said, hey, um, I want to take my wife some, to your restaurant, but she doesn't really, she's not going to eat any of this food. Is there any food that you can make that she would be used to, you know? So I think, there's a, I think there's a fear factor of like, that's African. And I could say, you know, that might be because of media, that might be because of, you know, bad experience, or, you know, you can name the other reasons, but, you know, there's a fear factor of going to, and you can have, you can have your doors wide open, but that's mean people are gonna come in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so, okay. so. <laughs> My suggestion is everybody go to the palace on Sunday. Everybody, everybody in the town go to the palace on Sunday at the same time. Is there anything else? I know for us. Before folks have to leave, for us. I just want to say, with regards to the wristbands, one of the things that we always need to do is because this film is really educated, so there's a niche audience for it. In order for us to be able to get it out to you sooner, we need to be able to prove that people actually want to see this film. 
So that bracelet on your hand, that's the hashtag. Yes, young generation. You guys are good at it. So you can hashtag the heck out of it. If you have one, I promise you, if you hashtag, you don't need the code until you do it. It's just bound A B A A when it's it's cap sensitive. Is it what do you call it? Case sensitive. Yeah. Without the code, you don't need that. And if you add Isaiah Washington, he will follow you and he will retweet you. I'm just saying, maybe that's a, that's a good selling point. I, but no, he will actually do it. So when you go to Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, please do us a favor, just hashtag if you saw it, whatever your thoughts are, because we, are in, we have to walk into those numbers and say that there really is an audience for this film. So thank you so much.